morning we're going to talk about being a hopeful people. Um, have you ever, you ever lost hope? You ever had your hopes dashed? You felt confident and something happened and it changed everything and you felt hopeless in that moment. Um, Martin Luther King Jr. once said, we must accept finite disappointment but never lose infinite hope. Infinite hope. I think that's one thing that would describe someone who claims to follow Christ, a Christian. We are, by definition, a hopeful people. This is who God has called us to be. So today we're going to look at what God's Word says about being a hopeful people. But before we get into that, we have to understand this, that throughout the New Testament, from the teachings of Jesus all the way to Revelation, um, we are told that suffering and disappointment and difficulty is a part of the Christian life. But at the same time, we're called to continue to follow him. You don't do that without hope. But Jesus promised that it was coming. He basically told us to expect it. In Matthew 5, he said, you're blessed when people, when they insult you and persecute you and falsely say every kind of evil against you because of me. Now, I don't know about you, but that's not how I define blessed, right? That, you, you're not posting a picture of that on Instagram with hashtag blessed. You know what I'm saying? You're not doing that. Oh, they, they, they cut me off in traffic. They lied about me at work. Uh, I am so richly blessed. That's not what we do. We, we post the picture with, with all the grandkids. So blessed, you know? After church on a Sunday morning, whatever it is, got the raise. Then we start talking about being blessed. But Jesus said you're blessed when the negativity happens, when the discouraging things happen, when the disappointments come, when they insult you, persecute you. He says in verse 12, be glad and rejoice because your reward is great in heaven. So you're going to be glad and rejoice now because the reward is coming later. That's how hope works. You don't hope for something you have right now. I don't have to hope for it. I don't have to hope that I wake up on Sunday, January 13th. That's today. It already happened. I'm not hoping for it anymore. We hope for something that is not yet in our grasp. In this life, we're promised difficulty, insults, persecution, problems, disappointments. I should say when these, happen, when these things happen, we shouldn't be surprised. It's not if, it's when and how often. But Jesus says it's an opportunity to rejoice. And why? Because we have hope. We have hope of a reward. We have a, a hope that there is something waiting us in the future that is better. Christians are hopeful people. It's about as simple as I can make it. We are a hopeful people. People, but what, is that, what does that mean? What does that look like in our lives? 2 Thessalonians chapter 2 says, May our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father, who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, encourage your hearts and strengthen you in every good work and word. Now, Paul is offering a prayer here, and the prayer that he offers is that they will be strengthened for the purposes of good works and good words. But he puts it within the context of understanding this, that Jesus Christ and God our Father has given us these two things, in eternal encouragement and good hope. So I'm going to give you this. We are a hopeful people because our future is known. We have eternal encouragement. There's two ways to think about that. Eternal as in it's a never-ending encouragement. It's encouragement that, that has no end. It just... It keeps, it keeps flowing. So even when we get discouraged, there is another layer of encouragement coming right behind it. That's one way, but there's another way, and it's really kind of the way the, the original language is structured, is that it's an encouragement for eternity. It is an ongoing, eternal, never-ending encouragement, but it is an encouragement for what is next. It's an encouragement for the future. Because almost all of us would agree that it doesn't matter how bad this particular moment is, if we know that if we know it's getting better, we still have hope. Some of you are thinking, yeah, Carrie, that's what 
rock bottom looks like. It can't go anywhere but up from here. It's like I can absolutely get my hopes up because I hit rock bottom in 2018. It's more than that. There is this eternal encouragement, but there is this encouragement for eternity. Ultimately, we're hopeful people because Jesus has secured our future. We can actively hope for tomorrow because we know that tomorrow is in his hands. That he is not sitting on the edge of his seat waiting to see what's going to happen next. Jesus isn't hoping. He's already there. It's not just that our future is secure. It's not just that Jesus has it. He's already there. He's not limited by our calendar or our clock. The book of Ecclesiastes says that he sees the whole in one moment. All of eternity in one moment. He sees it. Jesus lives in the present. And his present extends to our past and all the way through our future. It's eternal. He's the only one that can offer eternal encouragement or encouragement for eternity. Because he's already there. Our future is known. We should be a hopeful people because we've been given eternal encouragement, encouragement for eternity. So he says he's given us eternal encouragement and good hope. Now, I'm a pretty simple guy. So if I hear good hope, the first thing I ask is, does that mean that there's a bad hope? And what is bad hope? One thing I know is this, that that God doesn't give bad hope. I don't even know what bad hope is. The only thing I can come up with is that bad hope is false hope. Have you ever had false hope? You see, false hope is a confident feeling about something that might not be true. Truthfully, false hope is a confident feeling about something that is not true. Many of us, uh, we, we live with people in our homes that have false hope, right? We, we all know people that have false hope, right? They are confident about something that's not accurate, okay? False hope. But he gives us good hope. Jesus doesn't give False hope. I mean, I've had false hope before. It's, it's that moment where I finish the test, I hand it in, and I am confident, and I am also wrong. The sad reality is that anyone who is trusting in anything other than Jesus has false hope. But they're sincere. They're confident about something that's not true. He gives eternal encouragement and a good hope. It's real. We're hopeful people because our future is known, but we're hopeful people because our future is secure. See, Paul was very intentional with the words that he used. For those who would have originally heard what he wrote, there were oftentimes he would use language or even terms that would mean something different to them. So when you hear good hope, or when I hear good hope, I ask questions like, well, does that mean there's a bad hope? What's well, bad hope? Is that a false hope? When they heard good hope, they heard something different. And here's why. Because writers of the time, non-Christian writers, use the term good hope to refer to life after death. So think about this. Paul says, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us and given us eternal encouragement and good hope by grace. He's given us encouragement for eternity and he has given us not just good hope, life after death. Ultimately, the reason I have hope in this life is because I know that this life is not all that there is for me. When this life is done, I'm not done. I'm only just beginning. See, I'm encouraged and I'm hopeful because I know that this life is not all that there is for me. He has given me hope for eternity 
Because he knows it. He's already there. He knows what's going to happen next. When, when the sun comes up tomorrow, Jesus will already be there waiting on me. Waiting on me to open my eyes on a new day. But it's not just that. He has given me good hope. He has given me life after death. When you put all this together, God has given believers eternal encouragement and good hope. He's saying that not only should we have hope for tomorrow because he is already there and he is leading us and he is guiding us, but also we can have hope for eternity because Jesus has secured it. And if you've believed in Jesus Christ and given him your life and received his forgiveness, he has secured a place for you in eternity. In John 14, he said, I assure you, if I go to pre- prepare a place for you, I will without a doubt come again so that you may be where I am. For me, as a follower of Jesus Christ, I have hope because I'm not worried about the future. Jesus is already there waiting on me. He knows what's going to happen next. But not only that, when this life is over, there's a place for me. He's prepared a place for me. And he is going to come back because he wants me to be where he is. And whether we want to acknowledge or not, the deepest longing of our soul is for us to be where he is. And so anything that we look for hope for in this life, we're trying to fill that longing. If we're trying to get hope from a job or from a relationship, anything, an achievement, an accomplishment, it's because there's a longing in us. But everything else in this life, it's false hope. The good hope is that we will be where he is. And I have hope because he is there waiting on me. And he wants me to be where he is. But don't miss what comes next. He says, may our Lord Jesus Christ himself and God our Father who has loved us, given us internal encouragement and good hope by grace. By grace. If my hope for tomorrow and my hope for eternity is based on me, anything I do, my effort, my merit, I am utterly hopeless. There is no greater source of false hope than hoping in ourselves for the future. Hoping in ourselves to be united with Jesus Christ and made right with God. He says he has done all of this, he has given all of this by grace. The alternative that he could have plugged in there would have been by the basis of how good you are in this life. On the merits of how good you can do in 2019. No. It's all by grace. The eternal encouragement and good hope we have is based on the grace of God. It's based on the effort and the work of Jesus on the cross. It's based not on anything good that I think I might have done, but on the perfect righteousness of Jesus Christ. We're a hopeful people because our future is known and because our future is secure, but we're a hopeful people because our righteousness is not our own. I don't have to be good enough. Thank God. Because I'm never going to get there. I'm not a perfect man. I'm not a perfect father or husband or pastor or preacher or anything else I'm supposed to be good at. I'm not. Neither are you. And it's not okay that that's how it is if I don't lean into Jesus. I'm hopeful because I know I'm never going to be good enough. What makes you think you can get it all right this year? If you didn't last year or the year before, you're nev- you can't. You're going to fall short. You need him. In writing to Titus, Paul said, But when the kindness of God our Savior and his love for mankind appeared, he saved us, not by works of righteousness that we had done, but according to his mercy through the washing of regeneration and renewal by the Holy Spirit. We're hopeful because it's not just about, I'm going to do better this year. It's not, I'm going to turn over a new leaf. I got no leaves left to turn. 
There's no good in me. God's word says there is none righteous, no, not one. If any man says he doesn't have sin, he's a liar. That's all of us. We're all in this together, all fallen short, all failures before him, all in need of his righteousness because we don't have anything to bring to the table. If my hope is based on my merit, I am, yeah. God's word has set the standard for how we are to live. He said, I am, he said, you must be holy because I am holy. Anybody holy in the room? Nobody wants to raise their hand on that one, right? I mean, we want to. We want to. So we carry it. What, the, because the holiness doesn't come through our effort apart from the work of the Holy Spirit. We have been redeemed, regenerated, and now we are being renewed by the Holy Spirit. If my hope is based on me and my effort, my hope would be non-existent. I can't look back at a pattern of unwavering faithfulness in my own life. I stumble, I fail. And every time I think I'm gonna do better, I still fall short. In Philippians 3, Paul says, but everything that was a gain to me, I've considered to be a loss because of Christ. More than that, I also consider everything to be a loss in view of the surpassing value of knowing Christ Jesus, my Lord. Because of him, I've suffered the loss of all things and consider them as dung so that I may gain Christ and be found in him. Not having a righteousness of my own from the law. Not having a righteousness of my own because of what I did and how good I could be, but one that's through faith in Christ, a righteousness from God based on faith. The, only, the reason why Christians are hopeful people is because Christians realize they can't be good enough and they realize that their righteousness is not going to be their own. If there will ever be any righteousness in me, it won't be because of me or anything I've done. It'll be because God took him who knew no sin and made him sin for me so that when I'm in him, I can have the righteousness of Christ. So you can say, I am righteous but it's not because I did anything right it's because Jesus did everything right thank God my hope isn't found in me based on me I let me down I fail me but Jesus never fails his love and his mercy and his grace are always there when tomorrow comes he'll be there waiting on me when the sun rises on a new day, his word tells me there will be brand new mercies waiting for me. It's not just that you get to start a new year fresh. You get to start every morning fresh. And as I live this life now, I don't have anxiety over what happens after I die. I have hope because my future is known and my future is secured. And my righteousness is in Christ because I am in him. And one day he will come for me and I won't just be in him. I will be with him. First Thessalonians, Paul says, hey, I don't want you to, to worry and to grieve about the people who have died like the people who have no hope. Who are these people who have no hope? It's those who aren't in Christ. Now, they may have false hope, but they don't have any real hope. They don't have the good hope. He says, don't worry for them. For the Lord himself will descend from heaven with a shout with the voice of the archangel, with the trumpet of God, the dead in Christ will rise first. Then we who are still alive, who are left, and will be caught up together with them in the clouds to meet the Lord in the air and get this, and so we will always be with the Lord. Therefore, encourage one another with these words. I'm hopeful because Jesus knows my future, he has secured my future, and he has given me his righteousness, and without that, I have no hope. Hebrews 6 says, so God has given both his promise and his oath. These two things are unchangeable because it's impossible for God to lie. Therefore, we who have fled to him for refuge can have great confidence as we hold to the hope that lies before us. This hope is a strong and trustworthy anchor for our souls. Christians are, by definition, hopeful people. We're people who live every moment for all that it's worth but at the same time, we look to the future. 
We're the kind of people who can be lied about, can be insulted, can be persecuted, can be beat down. But we rejoice because we know there are rewards waiting for us in heaven. We keep our heads down. We work hard. We keep toiling at the task God has given us, whether that be our actual work or the ministry and calling that he has given us. But at the same time, we set our sights on heaven and the things above. We stumble, we falter, we fail, but we rise again. Proverbs 24, 16 says, though a righteous person falls seven times, he will get up. For some of you, it wasn't seven, it was 70 times you fell. But the righteous man gets up, do you know why? Because he has hope. Because he's a righteous man, not because of anything he did, but because of Jesus Christ. Trust me, I get it. Yes, no day goes exactly like we want. None of us are exactly what we wish we were. None of us are, we're not the, the mom or the dad or the husband, or the wife, the, the employee, the boss, whatever role, whatever hat, whatever title is on you in your life. You're, you, if you're looking in the mirror and honest, you're not all that you could be or maybe even should be. But as a follower of Christ, there is hope because we believe that everything that comes after this gets better. We believe that we have not yet lived our best days. They're not behind us. We don't hope for a return to the glory days because we know that God wants to do a new thing in us. And we know not only that, there's going to come a time where Jesus will return and he will make all things new. And he will wipe away every tear from every eye that grieves loss and pain and suffering. And forever we will always be with him. It's going to be infinitely better. So we have hope. All this is because of Jesus. When he laid down his life, to his followers it may have seemed like all hope was lost. But Jesus' resurrection from the dead brought hope to life in a way that it could never die. And for those who are in him, that is what is in us. So let me challenge you. It's okay. Get your hopes up. He won't disappoint you. Uh, don't hope in him or her or them or that. Hope in him. Trust him. He will, he will never leave you. He will never abandon you. He will hear your prayers. He wants to hear them. The Psalms say that he leans, he inclines his ear. It's like this. What was that again? For the next seven days, I hope it's not just seven days. I hope it, it sparks a renewal in you to pray and to believe and to hope because God loves his children and he longs to be in relationship with us. He longs for it so much that one day he's going to say, enough is enough, I'm going to go get them. And they're going to be right by my side. So Paul said, may the Lord Jesus Christ and God himself, who has given you eternal encouragement and good hope by grace, may he strengthen you for every good work and word. That's the prayer for us, too. So let's pray it now. God, I pray that you will strengthen our hearts for the sake of good works and good words, that you will revive hope in us. God, there's a chance that there is someone listening to me now or on a recording later, and if they're really honest with themselves, the only hope that they have uh, for being in a right relationship with you is it's based on how good they could be. It's based on them trying to clean up their lives, uh, turn over a new leaf, self-improvement, and it's hopeless. And I pray that today you will break through. You'll make it very clear to their heart their need for you, and that they will confess their brokenness and sinfulness before you and receive your forgiveness and your new life, that you will birth a good hope in them. God, there are also many who over time, 
the persecutions and the difficulties and the bad days kind of beat the hope out of them. They become a little bit pessimistic, maybe a whole lot cynical. Probably don't pray a whole lot anymore. They probably can't remember the last time they clearly knew that you had answered a prayer. And they've just kind of given up. And I pray that today and maybe over the next week, that you will rebirth a hope in their hearts and lives. That they'll hope again, that they'll believe again. God, you will not let them down. Thank you in advance for it. I pray it in Jesus' name.